Hello and welcome to Media Philosophy, where we normally explore the deeper side of entertainment, but today we're going to talk about something a lot more serious. I've got uh, Aaron Stark on the line, the presenter of I Was Almost a School Shooter, a TED Talk, and um, he is the founder of the You Are Not Alone Facebook group, which the link will be in the descriptions, and you can also find him at his Twitter handle, that is StarkDad13. 13. Aaron Stark, welcome to the welcome to Media Philosophy. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So I just want to dive right into it. Just real quick, what what was school like for you? Uh, school was very hectic. I went to many, many, many different schools. <clears throat> I never stayed at a school longer than about six months. I moved from place to place frequently. My family were very were like nomadic criminals. We were always running from authorities are getting evicted or um, we moved back and forth between Colorado and Oregon probably 20 times. Um, I went to 30 or 40 different schools growing up. <clears throat> so I never ever got to set down roots. I never felt like any, I had any school that was like my home school. I was always the new kid, totally the new kid. And it was rough because there was a lot of bullies, a lot of <clears throat> a lot of uh, stress, but I was also really, uh, because of my nomadic criminal family, I was uh, dirty and smelly, and yeah, school was a really rough time for me. And when did you start developing like some of these like violent thoughts? Um, was it like a single aha moment, or was it like this very slow build? It's it's a very slow build. So, and I, and I think this is a very it's a common thing. So it starts with the everybody starts as a good kid in my opinion we all start kind of like an innocent blank slate um and then for the first 15 years of our or so of our lives we don't really have any agency over anything that goes on it's, it's always controlled by the adults around us so for me <clears throat> it was i started with i i was the fat kid and then i was told that i was worthless all the time and i was told i was shit so I was, I, I, it starts with self-loathing where you start to hate yourself. And then that becomes your persona. You start to hate yourself so much that that becomes everything you agree with. And anybody that says different, that says, no, you're a good kid. They're the ones that are wrong. So you, you kind of internalize that self-hatred. And then as that metastasizes and grows, it becomes... Like I said, it becomes your persona, it becomes your outward, outward facing thing. So it turns into, okay, I'm going to be the best bad person I can be. And that progressively turns into getting bullied and then to being the bully. And you, you start down the slide towards, towards violence. So I personally, I was told I was worthless and that was nothing a lot. And I wanted, and I decided early about 13 years old that if I'm going to be a worthless piece of crap that I'm going to be the best worthless piece of crap I can be. And every, anybody else that's tried to say I was good or tried to fix me, they're obviously wrong because you must not know the real monster who I am. So now did you think of a future? Like when you were young, like did you picture a future when you were young? Never. I never thought of having a future. I never thought that my, I, I, I didn't think that I would last more than a year. I also never thought that I was memorable at all. I literally would walk around to my friends and ask, do you remember me if I leave the room? Like when I, when I leave the room, do you still know that I'm around? Like I, th I thought that I was nothing. I thought that I was the, the word I use now is ephemeral. I thought that I was just uh, like just tissue paper in the wind. That definitely sounds like just really hard because who, who no one wants to be invisible you know no one wants to be the invisible man now what what did you really want when you were like growing up what did i really want i think i wanted what everybody really wanted and that's to be told that you're a good person and for me so for everybody watching i'll go through a little bit about my story just so they can get some context about what we're talking about so i growing up in that violent home i i and internalized it, I became the worst person I could be. And that ended up, I, I, I describe it as wrapping that darkness around me like a blanket that I, I 
wanted to use that as kind of a filtering method where it would keep the people close to me that agreed, but anybody else that disagreed would push them away. And that after further going into self-harm and self-abuse and, and, and spiraling down the self-hatred spiral completely, I uh, was really bad hurting myself and I reached out multiple times for help. I tried to get help at social services a couple of times once, and then I tried mental health once, and <clears throat> they, both, neither one of them helped me. In fact, the social services was the most damaging thing that ever happened to me when they sent me home with my mom, and she told me that I should have done a better job, and she'll buy the razor blades, and that broke my brain, and I, as I was, when, when when I was living in that chaotic time, it was like a tsunami of anger, like of my whole world, like describing not having agency when you're a teenager. It was, I was living in this big hurricane of depression, just like, like I would go home and there'd be massive violence and drugs, people digging through the carpet, looking for crack cocaine and then beating each other up and stabbing each other in the gut with doorknobs, which, so that's a weird fact. If you take apart a doorknob, the inside part, the gears, that's a really dangerous weapon. Don't ever use that. <clears throat> um, so the that that kind of violence and self-hatred and self-loathing it it just grows and grows and while that when that when you're in that hurricane period where nothing is you don't really control everything everything's kind of sloshing around you bounce from place to place and you're dealing with extreme violence on every level of every kind of abuse you can think of and then once I sought help and I, I was that was slammed in my face and <clears throat> became toxic, getting help hurt me. <clears throat> that I found out what was at the bottom of all that. So underneath the hurricane, it gets really quiet and really calm because there's nothing left to lose and you don't have anything left to hurt you. <clears throat> so that's the spot where my brain kind of, I literally describe it as my brain like shattering like a mirror. Like when I walked out of the mental health, my brain just like cracked. And that <clears throat> the plan that I had for attacking either a school or a food court came up when I was living as a homeless teen for the couple years before that. I had a bunch of people that were ostensibly friends, but really it was just disaster groupies. They were just around me to watch the watch the car crash, to live vicariously through my damage, basically. And they, while we would sit around, instead of talking about like family football or girls or school, we'd talk about killing people. We talk about, so if you're gonna kill 10 people, how would you do it? And if I was gonna blow up a school, this was what I would do. And so when my brain shattered and I found out what was underneath that depression storm, <clears throat> I, that plan kind of just sprung into form. I had already spitballed it, I, already, I had already, played it out with with my friends i knew the, the the two places i was going to target was either the school or the mall food court and i knew where to get a gun because they had the gangbangers down the street that had guns all the time so i went about trying to get a gun and i had set to attack either my school or the mall and the only difference in those two targets would have been the time of day that i got the weapon there, there was if school was in session, go to school. If school was out of session, go to the mall. That, that was the only difference in between those two targets. And it's also important to note for anybody listening that neither one of those targets were what we would classify as soft targets. Like I, I wanted to cause the most amount of damage in the least amount of time with the least amount of security, but that <clears throat> both places had security. Like the, the, the particular doors I was going into, it would have taken a couple extra minutes for the police officer to get there. But in the school, there was an arm, armed officer stationed in the school at all times. And in the mall, there was a police station like three doors down from the food court. So <clears throat> there was, I was planning on dying by suicide by cop. So that's just, I just wanted to give a, the, just so when, we're, when you're asking me questions to give a little background of anybody that knows my story. Um, and but what pulled me out was the kindness of a friend of people, someone showing me that I mattered and that 
I was a real, my, my best friend, Mike, who's still my best friend to this day, 30, 30 years later, he would tell me that I was a good kid in a shit world. And he would tell me that all the time. You're a good kid in a crap world. And that being seen as a person when I didn't feel like a human, <clears throat> that's what changed me. And I think to get back to your question that started off that rant um, was what is everybody looking for? I think that's at the heart of it. What I was looking for was I just wanted to be a good, be told I was a good kid. I, I wanted to be, I, I, I thought I was good and I wanted to be a person. I wanted to be seen and wanted to be validated. I wanted to be recognized. And that's, that's eventually what ended up saving me. So it really is just insane how important words, you know, like not just thoughts, you know, cause you, you can think to yourself, like I'm a good person, but it really is important, you know, just people telling you things, just reinforcement. It's, it's just insane that if you just grow up being told, you know, you're trash, you're, you're, you know, you're nothing, you know, how you start to internalize it, but you just have like one light in your life that kind of like illuminates some of that darkness, you know, like all it takes is like one little, just one person. It sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. It really does. It just takes one person being able to see you, like I said, as a person, because when you, when you don't feel human, I didn't feel like I was a human at all. I felt like I was invisible. I felt like I was a burden. I felt like I was a waste of space. And when you're in that spot, having someone be able to notice you is, can be life-changing because there, there is a definite thing that is what I call negative positivity, where it, when, you, when you're in that spot that I'm describing, you <clears throat> people would either look at me like I was a monster or a project. So I was either something that I, to be af afraid of or something that you needed to fix. And both sides are equally depersonalizing. And so get, going up to somebody that's like that and saying, oh, you're a monster is just as damaging as saying, oh, let me get, you're broken. I can fix you. Here's, there's a 12 step program I can get you in here. That's, they're both, they, they both dehumanize you. They both, they both depersonalize you. To me, the, the real transformative, transformative change came when I was validated for, as a person, like I'm a good kid in a shit world. I'm, I'm, I'm a person living through pain. I'm not a monster. I'm not just a smelly homeless kid. I am a person who is going through valid experiences and feeling valid emotions. And I need to be validated because of that. And <clears throat> that doesn't involve just glad handing. It's not just, oh, everything's great. You know, it's seeing you as a person and be like, hey, you're a good, you're a person. I see you. Now, maybe you should stop being a toxic ass because that's what's getting you the problems. And being able to, and, and, and once you see that person as a person, once, once someone validated me as a human, I could accept that criticism. You know, if, if, if you are one of the ones who looked at me like I'm a threat or like I'm a project, then you can criticize me all day long and it's just going to roll off like water off a duck's back. It doesn't matter what you think of me. It's that you already wrote me off. I'm already broken to you. It doesn't matter what, you, what your opinion is. But if you see me as a person, and you and we've connected that you know that I'm a, I'm a human and you res, I know that you respect me as a as a one on one person, and then you say hey that stuff you did that right there that was negative you shouldn't be doing that that's bad that that will penetrate I'll listen to that part because you you've now become one of the, a, a trusted source instead of just someone who's out to damage me and or use me for your own ends, and I think that that is at the heart of what we're facing as society right now is that we have these toxic subgroups that use that method to target at-risk extremist groups to fill the holes in their life caused by people who are trying to ostensibly uh, help, but are in the process depersonalizing and dehumanizing them and making them susceptible to someone saying, no, no, you're a good kid. By the way, to be a good kid, that person over there needs to pay. Yeah, I do want to get more into that in a little bit about like how like online communities can be like this source of like camaraderie, but also like a toxic thing. But, but just what you were saying before that was just so powerful about like 
the dehumanization of being like viewed as like a monster or like you know like you said like a project i think that's that's very powerful you know like when when you go to someone like a social worker for help are are you aaron stark or or are you just a number on their docket for that day now in in, in your ted talk um you talked that you and your friend would just do mundane stuff together and, and that just felt like the most fulfilling what, what was it about the mundane activities that that were just so special to you because it was human it was it was a normal existence it was it when i went home i would i would go into my home and deal with people crawling through the floor looking for crack cocaine people i, I would walk into my bedroom in a peaceful tie house here rumbling outside go out my front door and see my stepdad beating my mom mercilessly into a bloody pulp on the floor and then when I would try to pull him off, she would attack me because I got in the middle of their fight. So I got both of them attacking me because I'm trying to help. And that was my home life. That was just a normal night. Like, so I couldn't get, I couldn't go home and sit down and watch a movie. Like we could never sit down and have a dinner and chill out and just talk about the day. It, that wasn't a world for me. So being able to have that, I call it my island of normal and my ocean of chaos. That I was I was living in that giant tsunami, but every now and then I had an oasis, and every now and then I had this one spot where <clears throat> I wasn't I wasn't the worthless piece of crap that needed to be shoved to the side. I was Aaron, and I was a kid who might be hungry, who liked that show, who what what music did I like to listen to, what what did I enjoy during the day, what things did I what things filled me up, because we all we all are we all live in our own heads. Everybody lives in our own heads. And we, all of us have likes and dislikes and things that make us, us. Okay. We all have, we have, we have our jobs or our, or our activities for the day, but then we have our own personal like hobbies and likes. And we all sit down and have this one thing that like, Oh, that's the thing that I really enjoy. You know, like for me personally, it's comic books, comic books and superheroes and video games. Like I can, I can sit and read I have the Marvel comics app. I can sit and read Marvel comics all day long my wife can sit and watch her shows and watch the the whatever on tv and i can be sitting reading comics next to her and feel completely content just doing my thing you know and having that bit of normal humanity when i felt like my I, my i was living my entire life in the fight or flight reflex my whole world was living in that response and being able to take a break from that and let my nervous system calm down a minute was cathartic. Now, it seemed like you were starting to touch on this, but but do you think these mass shooting phenomena in the United States, do you, do you think that's more of an individual mental health thing, or do you think it's a symptom of something greater within the United States? Well, first off, I, that brings up a point because you said it. I, I tend to avoid the terms mental health or gun control for specific reasons, because I find that they are diametrically opposed, but equally distracting. So when you mention gun control, you get lost in the minutia of the detail. You get lost, is that a bump stock? Is that ammunition? Is that an assault rifle? What kind of rifle? What kind of gun is that? And you get lost in the detail, and you lose sight of the actual goal of the argument. Same thing with mental health. Mental health is this big, gray, amorphous blob that doesn't really mean anything. It, there's no definition to it. Everybody's personalized. It's all really individualistic. So you, no one can really wrap their hands around what it really means. So saying gun control and mental health tend to divert and dissuade from the, the, the heart of the conversation, which is actually that we need to keep weapons of, of destruction out of, people who, out of the hands of people who were in the state that I was in 30 years ago. And that they're... That, if you are a reasonable, rational adult with a license and training, you're not the one we're worried about. Like that we have to find a, a middle ground there. And that, so that just as a, as a diversion from that, just for, for terminology. Um, but I do think that, that there is a strong tie between personal mental stability and these extremist groups, because at the heart of it, as I say, we are all at the end of the day just wanting to be told that we're good people. It's it's like it reminds me of that line from Adams from uh, from the Wedding Singer from by the movie by Adam Sandler. At at the end of it, we all just want to be held and told we're okay, you know. And 
when if you are a kid who is who you think you're unattractive, you think you're alone, you think no one likes you, you've been rejected by girls at school, you've been rejected by your friends, but then you find this subgroup that accepts you because of that and those negative things, and then gives you tips on how to become more negative so that they can give you more positive adulation. And so that they can show you how good you are by you becoming more negative then you're going to become the worst person you can be so you can get the positive affirmation from them. <clears throat> and that's what we, I think we have. We have all these kids who are craving positive reinforcement and receiving it from the most negative places possible. And like I say, if, you, if, you, if, you're, if your goal is to be told you're a good person and you're going to be okay, but in order to get that, you get, you're going to be a good person, you're going to be okay, but to be okay, that other person needs to pay. And the reason you're not okay is because that other person's causing you pain. Then you're going to direct all of your energy towards fighting that. It's, it's weaponizing xenophobia. It's weaponizing our own innate sense of fear of the other. And at the heart of it, that's what broke it down for me is that I was the other. And someone looking at me like I wasn't and penetrating that, that veil of, of, presupposition that I can, that I am not the label that you stuck on me, that I'm actually a person. And I think that with these kids in these, these subcultures, I deal with quite a lot of them. I, there, there's a lot of people who reach out to me from those kinds of groups. And invariably, I find that they, they all think that they're, that at the heart, they're good people. And that they want to do good, but they want to find good things, but someone has done negative to them. And so now they need to, they're trying to find a way to rationalize in their own heads why that negativity has happened and how they can fix it. They just happen to pick the worst possible methods. And if you show them and give them other options, it, you have to be careful because you can hit that same toxic positivity. Are they a project? Did you see them as a person? Did you did you meet them one on one? Because you it it turns into the people who are meeting them one on one are the ones who are telling them that the reason why the women didn't do them is because they're 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 you're just you're just a, a Eugene. They only want chats. Like that that group. As the ones that are filling up those holes that you're pushing away because you're not filling them yourself. And it's interesting because it sounds like in those more, you know, traditionally like, like I, I like that term first. So I'm going to say that toxic positivity because it is very dehumanizing. It's very not actually like based in reality. You know, it's very like everything's fine when sometimes not everything is fine. Mm -hmm. Where it is and, those and it's more. Almost entirely, it's almost entirely built from the beginning on adults wanting to indemnify themselves from liability. So instead of trying to get to a goal of fixing, they get to a goal where they say they're doing something to fix it while at the same time not being liable for not fixing anything. And, and then there's the more t traditional, like those inseldom like forums and whatnot that I feel like, like you're, like you're saying does, uh, you know, recognize the individual, the individual struggle. But like you said, it does kind of promote this more, just hateful attitude like it's just more poison but at least you're like being recognized as yourself like like you said yourself if you're going to be a bad person you might as well be the best bad person you can be well and so so take that phenomenon and I, i'm a personal fan of looking at the media that the that they don't i look at the media from the other side's perspective that they talked about themselves so i'm i'm a democrat and so i watch a lot of hardcore republican news and, and like the farthest right fringe okay and looking at those two sides, the, the extremists who seem to be spinning out into the violence seem to be coming mostly from the right these days. Now, if you take that phenomenon that we were just discussing of the toxic positivity that is depersonalizing and turns it into a mechanical function, and then the aggressive negative positivity that is... The, that looks at you one-on-one, -on -one, but then fills you with, with hate. That's the two different media spheres right now. 
So look at the two main media producers we have. We have the Rachel Maddow show on the, on the, on MSNBC. We have Tucker Carlson on Fox. Okay. I watch both of them all the time. So if you watch either one of their shows, Rachel Maddow is very studious and very professorial. If you watch the first 20 minutes of her show, it's usually a deep dive monologue into some obscure historical fact that tangentially applies to the, to the story of the day. It actually has deep meaning. There's, there's a deep story in there and there's, there's, there's facts and there's relevant figures and, and it all ties together intellectually. Okay, But it's an intellectual endeavor to watch that. If you watch Tucker Carlson, that same 20 minutes is filled with these people hate you. These people are making you the victim. And here's why you personally need to be afraid of these people and why these people are taking away your pain and taking away your pleasure. And they're taking away all of your joy and they're attacking you personally because they hate you. That's it's all personal messaging directed at the person. No, there's no professorial examination. It's all directed exactly at the emotional appeal of the person specifically. And they're, so it's utilizing that exact phenomenon. It's utilizing the I'm I'm looking at you personally. I'm I'm addressing you one on one. You're not a, you're not a number. You're not a project. You're a one on one person. So I'm address that, and then I fill you with you want to be good, but you need to be good. You need to take out those people because those people hate you. And those ones over there, they don't see you as a person. They only see you as a project. They only see you as a number. And so they're the ones that are causing you all the pain. And that's the entire messaging system from the right wing right now. Their, their their podcasts do it, their their radio shows do it. It's it's their that's their mechanism for doing it. And that's how they end up with diehard groups of people that will go against their personal objective personal best interests to help what would appear to be negative, but hits them on a personal level that it, it addresses a personal one-on-one -on -one thing that they're talking about that if you're not listening to it then you've turned them into a number so it's it's this phenomenon writ large the one that 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 negative message also just seems way more consumable too you know like just like you know there's a whole bunch of like mcdonald's it's way easier to eat like mcdonald's you know it's, it's you know you don't have to think about it you just know what you want where you know, like with Taco Carlson, like you can just sit there and like 20 minutes will go by. And then um, for the other show, it's it's very that's a good way to put it. It's very much it's it's the difference. If, if you were to put it in a food analogy, Tucker Carlson is like McDonald's. Rachel Maddow is like eating at Chili's. Neither one of them are very nutritious. Neither one of them are very good for you. But to eat at Chili's, you need to read a menu. And you need to wait for the waitress to come over. And you need to sit down and you're going to have to wait to pay for your check. McDonald's, you walk up to the counter. And you probably already have it on your phone. You could have even ordered on your phone, tap the button on your phone. They walk up, they say your name, they hand you your food. They know who you are and you don't need to have any interface. So it's, it's similar. So a phenomenon that also exacerbates that and is a complementary thing is talk radio, which is like the, the invisible arm of the right-wing media sphere, which, so take that phenomenon of the personalization aspect. Now, talk radio adds the interactive personalization. So if someone watches Sean Hannity, they watch him for an hour and they get that one hour of that personalized, these people are going after you messaging, okay? But then if you listen on talk radio, you get that same messaging for four solid hours and you can call it and talk back. You can call in and ask him questions and he will answer you personally. And then when you answer the phone, you're actually talking to Sean one-on-one. -on -one. So that one-on-one -on -one personalization that breaks down those barriers happens on a mass scale and in a media sphere that no one listens to besides that group. There's no, there's no people on the left that pay attention to talk radio. The, the, it's entirely a right-wing media sphere, and because everybody else has abandoned it, they they've, they're on podcasts, they're on media, they don't care. But the truckers who are driving alone all day long, this is their main media, and so you have completely turned them invisible. You have depersonalized them. You have pushed them into their own media sphere, but that media sphere now has grabbed onto that and said, no, you're mine. And this is exactly why you're a real person. And I see you every day. And these are the things you like and these are the things you don't like. And, and you like this kind of food. You like these kinds of songs. You like these kind of people. And I like you too. And so that, that they get grabbed onto 
by that group. And it's because we've the the other side has made them invisible. They have depersonalized by by toxic positivity by saying, in order to help you, I have this program we can get you into. We can we can deprogram you. We can put you in a different media group and deprogram you. And what does that mean? That means I'm a machine and you're programming me. So even your attempt to try to help, which if if you take the professorial, and I'm a Democrat saying this, I'm very liberal. I'm 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 on the Democrat side saying this. But if you take that professorial method, you will shoot yourself right straight in the foot by ignoring the fact that the other side doesn't do any of that and laughs at you for doing it. And then just to um, switch gears a little bit here, um, you know, two years ago, a lot of people like face loneliness for the first time in their life, you know, with the lockdowns. What is so painful about loneliness? Oh, loneliness is the worst feeling in the world. Loneliness is, it's isolating. It's, it's when you get shut into your own head and then no one else can see in. That's, we, we rely, all of our days we rely on people peering into our own heads, peering into what we are. What, what do you like? What do you do? If you're, with your, if you're sitting with your significant other, how was your day? What did you do for your day? What did you feel about today? What do you like about that? You're watching a movie. Oh, that was funny. I laughed at that. You laughed at that with me. We have the same thing going on in our brains. You know, that's that's how we generate personal connectivity is we recognize the commonality of that's happening in your head. This is happening in my head. We have the same thing going on so we can talk. And so having, but when you don't have that and you shut off that and you, you, I think it was a combination. The, the worst thing ever was masking. Masking was the worst thing ever. And because blatantly from the beginning, everybody knew it was only minorly effective. Everybody knew it was only minorly effective, even in the best case scenario. Because in order for masking to be effective, you had to wear those stupid N95 masks that actually sealed off your entire face, and nobody did. We all wore cloth masks. And everybody knows, if you just take basic science, that if you have a cloth mask that's supposed to protect everything, but it has all these holes on, and you're constantly lowering it to take a drink, and you're constantly moving it around, and it's the same mask you've used for the last five days, it's not doing anything to protect you. It's covered in the germs you're trying to stop. And we all knew that. We all knew that. All the Democrats knew that. Everybody on the liberal side knew that. But we used it because it was our tag that, well, masks is doing something. Because instead of actually fixing things, we as a society like to think that we're fixing things and act like we're fixing things and then get credit for taking effort on fixing things without actually fixing the problem. And so we wanted to make, we wanted to appear that we were helping. And we wanted to make, to do something because something is better than nothing. But the something was more toxic than the nothing because masking made not only did it turn into a calling card from the other side who immediately could see that, hey, you guys can see also that none of this isn't working. You know it's not working. You're fooling yourselves that it is working. And why are you doing that? Like everybody could see it, but we stuck to it the entire time. Okay. And then it also became. A gree gree. A gree gree is a, it's an old term for like a shamanistic totem. It became the kind of thing that where, well, I have my mask, so I'm doing something good. Well, but what did you wash your hands? Did you like, did you, did you not cough in someone's face? Cause th those things are good enough, you know, like, like we, we, a combination of the masks, which then shut off our, our faces and made the isolation. When we also, at the same time, again, for, for on our on the liberal side, I'm, I'm going to pick on liberals a lot in this conversation, evidently, um, uh, is that we police language way too much. And the combination of putting a face mask on that we were causing people to wear that was just blatantly kind of stupid, because even the main doctor said that it's just kind of stupid unless you're doing it like a doctor. Then we also police the language to the point where Every small insult and every small slight becomes an attack. I think those were the worst decisions we could have made. I am a follower of George Carlin. 
I am a fan, uh, and I really think that we all should get back to listening to that philosophy of, and George Carlin is the best philosopher, in my opinion. He's not a comedian, he's a philosopher. And in my, it, it, my estimation, the best philo philosophy he has ever given us was, there is no weight in words besides that which we give it. There, there, there is nothing wrong with the N-word. I'm not going to say it because YouTube will be monetized, because YouTube thinks there's something wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with the N-word in and of itself. It's a perfectly acceptable word. It is fine. It has certain amount of letters with, with syllables. It's a word constructed like any other word. The problem with the word is the idiot who's using it and the intent behind it. The word itself is innocent. It's the, in, it's the intent and the usage behind it that's the problem. It, the, if we police the language, we pay no attention to the intent. It's, if I say N-word, Okay, if I'm talking about the N word, I'm effectively saying that word. I'm putting that word in your head. You thought that word when I said it. In order to decode what N word means, you had to say it. So I'm saying the same thing. I'm just using coded language to do it. It's it's there's no fundamental difference in that word then. What's the difference between the N word and the actual N word? There's no difference there. There's the implied nicety of that word that now I'm covering it up because of the implied social status. When the real, real problem isn't someone like me who's saying about the N-word, talking about it in an intellectual context. The problem is someone who's saying that word, attacking a Black person, calling them a derogatory name. It's not about the word. It's about the attack and the derogatory name. It's about, it's about dehumanizing, depersonalizing. You can do it with anything. We do it with the, the right now has done it with the word woke. Woke is just as a negative connotation in that in that social sphere as the N-word is in a black social sphere. It's that it doesn't have the same social connotation, doesn't have the same historical weight, none of that kind of stuff. But in a personal social setting, if you're hanging out with a bunch of right wingers and they call someone woke, it's the same insult. It it's it's just the it's not the word. The word is simply meaning to wake up, to stop from sleeping, to achieve consciousness. It's the intent of the usage behind it. It's the one who's saying that word and what I'm trying to push off and what I'm what I'm trying to put into your mind by saying this word. That's the point of it. And when we police language to the extreme absurdity that we have on the left, and then we insist that people wear our gree gree and put our, our, our mask on when we know it didn't do hardly anything, then the things that do actually work, like vaccines, get attacked and, be, and belittled. And then we force people to wear our mask and we force people to, to put on our gree gree. And we, 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 the things that, we, that actually do affect people then get dismissed. Like vaccines got super attacked even though they are legitimately what stopped the pandemic, they have saved so many lives and have been able to make me not have to wear a mask anymore and not have to do all the precautions because I'm fully vaxxed and boosted. If we had focused the way we should have and respected people's opinions, we could have, we could have changed a lot of that. Now, it was exacerbated by the fact that we had the orange tangerine in office who would not acknowledge any of those facts so and it's not both sides were stuck in their information silos and hating the other side the entire time and i i i just feel that we're at a spot right now in this country where we're splitting at the seams with everything everything seems to be splitting apart but the one thing that i found that ties everybody together is this sense of self isolation and self worthlessness this this sense that that you don't belong it, it it seems like that is damn near universal i've had similar conversations with republicans and democrats and atheists and christians and people in every kind of culture people from alabama and people in Sen uh, senegal having the same conversation at the heart of it that they just want to be held and told they're okay. That they just want to be, everybody just wants to be validated as people. And that if, if this pain and isolation and worthlessness is the one thing that can bind us together and connect us, 
then maybe we should focus on that and see that, that look, give love to the ones that we think deserve it the least. It's it's not the ones who deserve it the least, but the ones that we feel deserve it the least. Because if, if I'm looking at someone and I have the presupposition that that person on the other side, that's the other, that's the different, that's the one I should love the most. That's the one I should give more attention to and more care to. Because whatever it was in me that made me push out them into that xenophobic other area needs to be eliminated. Because there really isn't any difference. Now, it does and seem like everybody, it's... Everybody listening to this, everybody listening to this, everybody watching this, and everybody around everybody listening to this, we all took a poop today. Everybody. Everybody took a poop today. Every, every person on this planet sometime today is going to poop. The great equalizer. The great equalizer. Um, I mean, just, it seems like it's the, while everyone does, you know, deserve the love, deserves, you know, that, you know, attention, it does seem like it's the young adults, the teenagers that may struggle coping with it, you know, just have the hardest time coping with all those feelings. What can, like, we do, what can adults do to help, like, the teenagers, the young adults go through this? Give them space and time and not try to shove them into whatever hole you want to put them in. Remember as an adult that you were a teenager too and that our brains aren't fully formed until we're mid-25. And that if change, the only thing constant in life is change. The only thing absolutely certain is that tomorrow is going to be different than today. It might be, might be better, it might be worse, but it will be different. And so we have choices with that. We can either resist the change and let it wash across us like water on the ocean and get beaten down until we're pebbles on the, on the sand. Or we can adapt with those changes and become the water itself and move with it. And at the, heart, at the end of it, that's all we are, is that change. You're different today than you were six months ago. Physically, personally, everything. Seven years ago, every cell in your body was different. Every single cell in your body regenerates within seven years. So the entire physical being that is you was literally a different person seven years ago. So that, that makes no sense to try to stay as we are. And so as adults, if we're looking at our kids and we're thinking, oh, you're, you're going down that path, they need to pu push you away from it. Acknowledge that they're who they are, see them as people, remind them that you were their person too, and walk a path with them. Don't shove them on a path. Walk a path with them. My, I, I have four kids, okay? And when I was growing up, I was, like I described, I, I had so much pain in my life, I talk about it on stage growing up now. But my children, I tell them I love them so much, it's annoying. Every single conversation, it's an I love you. Every single time I talk to them. I, I my 21-year-old my daughter is my best friend. And that means that I won at life. Because when I see my kids, they're gonna have struggles, they're gonna have problems, they're gonna go down, they're gonna have issues. And I can see that, yeah, you're struggling, but you're gonna make it through it because change is gonna happen. And if you keep on going and you just don't give up and you keep pushing forward, you're gonna make it through because you started good and you're gonna end up good. And we just have to not write off our kids. We have a, a lot of adults have a tendency to write off their children because they're giving the adults problems. Because as adults, we, we want to protect ourselves from liability and protect ourselves from any heartache. So if it's going to give us a headache to deal with that kid who's depressed, then we're not going to do it. We're going to give him to a therapist. And if it's going to give us a headache to deal with that kid who's true at school, we're not going to do it. We're going to deal, let the police officer at school deal with it. And then we're going to punish him because he's not following our rules instead of realizing that they're people too, and they deserve respect. And the instant you acknowledge them and give them respect, then you're going to be on the same footing as that toxic asshole who's giving them that respect down the street. And if we want to counter-program any of those extremist groups, we have to do it by acknowledging the kids as people and starting there. Start somewhere, because if you don't start somewhere, you're not going to get anywhere. Now, it definitely does sound like at the end that you did win. I mean, to be best friends with your 21-year-old daughter, I, I can't imagine like a just a better gift. Um, 
Now, in a lot of states, they're starting to talk about, like, arming teachers in class, you know, like giving them the right to, like, you know, ha carry a firearm. What kind of thoughts or feelings does that invoke in you? I think that's the worst possible idea. I think that both arming teachers and hardening the schools are throwing band-aids on a gaping wound. And that same it's that same phenomenon I was discussing earlier of adults attempting to try to fix things by appearing to fix things without actually fixing the problem. Instead of addressing the kids where they are, they're going to harden the schools and they're going to make the, the teachers the, the, the turn into shooting people instead of addressing a, the depressed kid who wants to do the pain. Like, it's a bunch of kids in pain trying to navigate depression without adult guidance. And the adults are pulling back even further from giving guidance instead, saying, no, no, you're a threat. No, you're, you're a target now. Now you you who's might who might be sad and depressed the instant you're sad and depressed and you express it physically you express that depression at all then now you're a target now you're a, now you're going to be a threat so you better hide it you better stuff that down you better only express it to people who who understand you and they're going to tell you how to become a better person at hiding it and how to stuff it down even more and then how to lash out and destroy with it. I mean, it really seems to go back to that whole like creating a monster sort of thing. I mean, if if how how can a teacher not view a student? as a threat when they do have that that sort of you know deadly power right right at their side yeah well and and i've never met never i've met hundreds and hundreds of teachers and doing what i'm doing now i get reached out with teachers all the time i speak at teachers conventions i speak at school administrators never met a single teacher that wants to carry a gun not one that wants to carry a gun i've met teachers who are to school administrators are making them try to carry guns now and making them go to classes but there's a teacher that i was talking the other day her school district has a 24-hour class now. You take a 24-hour class, and now you can carry a gun in school. She had to take 15 years of school to become a teacher. She has, still has to take multiple years of, of schooling every, all the time. She has to take multiple months of schooling every year to continue to be a teacher. But with one 24-hour class, now she can carry a gun into that classroom? One day of training, and now you can kill a student. But it takes years of, of training to teach a student. Definitely seems like the priorities are a little, <clears throat> a little skewed there, to say the least. Yeah, yeah. Ass backwards is a better way to put it. <laughs> now, um, I really appreciate all the time that you've been spending here. I have one last question here, and, and you've sort of covered it quite a few times here. But, but just to those kids who may be struggling with some of these thoughts, these young adults who might be just like feeling like invisible, who might just not be feeling like, you know, a person. What, what would you like to say to them? Don't give up that you are in fact worthy and you do in fact matter. And that this pain that you're in right now is temporary. That the, the, you have already survived your worst days and the darkness you were in will end up in light if you keep on walking. Put one foot in front of the other and keep walking. If you just keep putting one foot in front of the other, eventually you will notice that you have moved. And give love to the ones you feel deserve it the least. They need it the most. Thank you very much. Again, this is Aaron Stark, uh, the speaker of the TED Talk. Uh, I was almost a school shooter. If you would like to reach out to Aaron Stark, you can uh, either email him at aaronstarkauthor at gmail.com. You can also reach him via Twitter with his Twitter handle, um, StarkDad1313. Again, that's at StarkDad1313. If you would like to be a part of his Facebook group, um, you can find that at You Are Not Alone, one word, capital U, capital of each first letter, You Are Not Alone. That is at Facebook, and those links will be in the comment set or in the description below. Aaron Stark, again, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it.